lives. Every day that we wake up, we have a choice to make. We can stay in bed, we can go back to sleep, we can wake up by the sound of the alarm, or we could roll over and see what time it is to see if we could get a little more sleep. We can choose to get up and begin to operate our day according to what we see, according to what we feel, according to what we hear as we turn on the radio or if it woke us up by music or by an alarm. You always have that opportunity to choose what kind of day you have because circumstances don't dictate what your day is. God does. And it's your response to God that determines what kind of day you're going to have. To have a good day, you would choose to operate according to what God says the day is designed for you to be. So if you work with God, if you listen to God, if you see God in your day, then you can operate and work within your day to make it a good day. Sometimes when people want a good day, they don't necessarily want God in it. But Jesus said something interesting. He said, call no one good, because the only good is in your Father, which is in heaven. So, if you would have a good day today, if you would seek to hmm, operate God's way, then choose to make this day good that He has created and that He has made. Because when God created the universe, He did it in six days. But in each circumstance, when He had created it, He looked upon it and saw that it was good. What you see by the end of your day will determine whether or not you did it God's way or your way. And if you do it God's way and walk with Him, listening to what He has to say to you, then you'll find that today was a good day. In daily life, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. We do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The God of all grace, who has called you unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. In all that we do today, the choices as we put on the armor of God is not to attack, it's not to react, but it's to be protected. Because you see, the armor of God, armor itself, was never meant to be offensive. It was meant to guard and to protect, to deflect at times, to cover, as it were, the vulnerabilities that we may have. So when you recognize that armor was designed to reinforce that which you already have, the knowledge of salvation, as the helmet of salvation is called, the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that we are in all of our puffed up in this when we throw our chest out, that we haven't been made righteous by our own works that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And we know that the truth around our belt causes us to hold our pants up so that we are caught with our pants down, so to speak, and embarrassed because we've been lying or telling a fib or doing something that was contrary to the truth, helps us to recognize who we are and what we are. And when you know all of the aspects of the armor of God, you recognize that it's not for offense, but it's for your protection. And God is your salvation. He is your helmet of salvation. He is your belt of truth. He is your preparation of the gospel. He is all those things that you need for this day to walk in accordance with His will and His way. The unity of the Spirit. There is one body, and one spirit. 
Through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. The whole idea of somehow in these latter days causing consternation, dissertation, division, strife, anger, malice, wrath, and angst inside the body of Christ was never intended by Jesus himself. He said that our love would be made manifest, that we would prove and demonstrate by our love for each other that we are his disciples because we would recognize that we are a holy habitation that have become individual parts of a bigger picture, that we have become a structure that God has designed in order to create for himself by his Holy Spirit into the world a unified body of believers that whether they would be Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or Protestant or Methodist or Baptist or Fundamentalist or any kind of ist at all, if they had a personal relationship with Jesus, it didn't matter where they came from or where they were going inside of this structure that was built and constructed like a tabernacle with dead skins on the outside. But what was most important was what was on the inside of the heart. Does that person, that individual, have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because if they do, then they are his disciples indeed, and they would prove it by the love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, by the love that they have for the brethren. Does that unify every other believer that just simply calls upon the name of the Lord? Not necessarily. But it does prove this, that the Spirit of God will only come into a man and cause him to bear fruit as he is walking in fellowship with God and being taught by God. Because prior to the Holy Spirit coming inside a person, the Spirit on the outside convicts a person to bring them and convince them of the relationship that is needed to become born again, so they would be one in the Spirit with all those body of believers that, though they may separate themselves in little structures and tents as they assemble themselves together, even as the children of Israel did, the twelve different tribes as they got all around the tabernacle and were designated in their spots, some to the north and the south and the east and the west, likewise, you'll find that when we come together as brethren, the one thing that makes us brethren isn't just Jesus, but it's the love that we have for one another. So we must always cultivate that in this world to unify in those things that promote, designate, highlight, and shine Jesus himself, rather than all those things that bring us down and tear each other apart. Jesus is calling us today to walk in love. Isn't that a better way to go today? To make your day one of love for God?